Ennis Cosby was a teacher. As a boy, Ennis struggled to learn, and he didn't know why. Eventually, through testing, good teaching, and his own hard work, Ennis came to understand that he simply learned differently and that he could succeed in school. And succeed he did, earning a master's degree in education. Just like Ennis, one in five people has a learning difference. Ennis was dyslexic. For others, these difficulties have names like attention deficit, learning disability, or dysgraphia. Many of those children, though, have no name for the feelings of frustration they experience in school. Ennis understood what happens in the hearts of children when they are left out in the first big job of their lives, learning in the classroom. He taught because he believed that all children could find their gifts and learn how to share them. All of the people in this film have learning differences. Ennis Cosby was a great listener, and he would have heard the pain in their stories. But most of all, he would have heard the hope. Being in that second grade reading group, and, and I was in the lowest, and knowing that you weren't going to climb out of that, you knowing you weren't going to go, was in some ways a mark. It left this mark on you. It was embarrassing because of the labels they put on you. Um, and so you didn't want people to think you were stupid. I wasn't verbally, verbally strong. I was very quiet. I was very, um, I didn't, I didn't really think a lot. I would just do things, be really um, impulsive. <laughs> what I had the most difficult time doing is sitting down and putting pen to paper this is such a slow process for me. My mind would work so much faster than my ability to write. And being a stutterer, I, um, I couldn't uh, help my teacher assess my learning except through written examinations. For me, the words just didn't seem to come off the paper right. Uh, and, um, and that was, to me, now looking back on it, that was kind of the small problem. The big problem was, was my self-esteem because I thought everybody else was smarter than me because they're better readers, you know, they're better students than me. So to be honest with you, I lost interest in school. I didn't want to go to school. I, you know, what do I want this frustration for? I was angry and I didn't want to, I didn't want to learn. It was only recently that my own mother said to me, isn't that something? We just thought you were stupid. Me and my mom were in a lot of fights I, I just was like, I was like, why does this have to happen to me? Why? There's, everybody else there is perfect, and I'm just not. It's a different world today. And I'm different, no question about it. I look at things differently. As chairman and CEO of one of the nation's largest bank-owned finance companies, my guest is responsible for over 7,000 employees and more than $40 billion in assets. His creative approach has given him a true edge in business, but this advantage actually grew from necessity. Joining me now, Don Winkler. He's the chairman and CEO of Finance One, and welcome, Don. Thank you for coming. Good to be here. I mean, most people today take things for granted that I look at and say, gee, I have to really understand more about that. I have to ask more questions. So I ask a lot of questions, and the asking of which sometimes lead to breakthroughs in people's thinking, including my own. When you were working at Citibank in Greece, you actually put in one branch the president there in the lobby of the bank. And lo and behold, profits increased by 5,000% by the time all was said. Here I'm in Greece. And we, we said, what is the one principle to really get to understand how you can do better business and faster business? And the principle was to get the decision maker closest to the customer. Uh, and he said, gee, I can get these transactions done four times faster. I need only to do this, this, or this. My goodness. It was amazing. It's one of the biggest success stories I've ever had. Now, where did it come from? A learning difference? Yeah, probably he did, because I look at things differently, right? It wasn't, here. he was at the top, here's where the customer was, we just took him from here down to here. Hey, 
I make mistakes every day. We all do. Mine are very visible because they deal with you know language and language skills that today give me the same problems as they were when I was back in the third reading group. What I found in, in, in my life is that I'm, by, as, having the learning difference I have, I'm disoriented all the time. So my key job is to keep myself centered. I have disciplined myself to go to bed at nine o'clock. Go to bed at nine and get up at three. Now why? You know, I have to get ready to compete. I may have to warm my eyes up. So I have some eye charts that I use to warm my eyes up some days. Uh, I know there's 127 words or so that I mess up on. I have those there. I can look at those. Do the times table just to get warmed up. And I know that if I keep trying and working on different things, I will be able to do it. So I keep trying different methods and techniques using that, that concept. My, my visual memory is not the typical mind's eye, you know, captures everything. And I've had to train myself to get other visual memories by using every other sense I have. People would say, that's pretty stupid. What is that guy doing out there laying in the field of daffodils? Well, I was out there trying to taste, feel, touch, and capture that visual memory. I visually can see it even right now. Now, can I tell you scientifically what happened? Can I tell you it's a cognitive memory? Can I tell you that my on one side, the left side versus the right side? I can't explain it to you. I have no answer. I just know that if you experiment enough, you can, you can accomplish a lot, going from the third reading group to the first reading group. When I was growing up, I loved to sing. And the place where you could sing was church. And so when I went to church, I would go and I would sing, you know, prayers to the Lord and would cause a disruption. One day, uh, my minister came over to me and sat down with me and said, you know, why don't you come over on Thursdays when we're putting together what we're going to sing for Sunday? And I'll go through the songs with you. We can underline some of the words here in a hymnal and you can take the book home. I said, take the book home. You're not allowed to take books home from church. <laughs> no, you can take the book home and you can practice and I'll never forget it as long as I live. He didn't make any assumptions. He treated me with total innocence and learned what the problem was in the subtlest of ways and took that, took those, took those, uh, you know, the, 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 the whole situation and turned it into a success for me because he took the opportunity to learn what the real problem was. That thing about being stuck there in the third reading group has provided more positive impetus for me than anything else, than anything else could have happened. With, with in the industry today, people like to be around me. They ask me to other, other businesses uh, in and out of the, of the bank, ask me to come visit with them. You know why? They want my creativity. And you know what? It's a gift I've gotten from my learning difference. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you. <laughs> Your show. Thank you. It's good to be here. My name's Don, so Mr. Winkler now. When I walk into a classroom, whether it's for kids with learning differences or just kids in general, I have to think of the four-letter word, hope. Uh, I, I role model. Uh, I want to, I, when I go, I think of that. I think of, you know, here, for a kid that has a learning difference, here's hope for you. I sat, when I was your age, in the same seats that you're sitting in today. When I find when I go to schools, a candor develops between us. And a, uh, what I find is, is that the kids open up to me. It seems like I, I'm the only one that ever has. Up till now, you're the only one. Up till now, I'm the only one that ever has this problem, like anything, like to, to calling a person or talking on the phone, it's like everything's a problem for me. It's like a big, giant journey, you know? It's, it's like. Big, it's a big gob of stuff, right? Yeah, it's like I can't do anything right. I want to be there to help as many as I can. Why? Because I don't want people to go through what I've went through. They shouldn't have to.
little Henry Winkler wanted to do well, but it was reading, it was spelling, it was math, you know? It was retaining, it was focusing. I felt like I was in a maze, like a huge maze, which I was just stuck in the middle. If it started out in reading, and with the, uh, a learning difference in reading, then it became about how I looked at some point. <laughs> it became about being long and tall and awkward and lanky and clumsy. And it became, uh, and it, 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 it had an, an effect on, on even my athletic proudness. It had an effect on everything. No matter how hard I worked, I wasn't going to get the grades that, that the other kids in the class were getting. And, and I never could figure out why. I mean, I really couldn't figure out why. I mean, I, I really believed early on that it, was, that it was a matter of guessing what the teacher wanted, you know? I mean, I, and I just never guessed right. I didn't have a lot to say. There weren't very many words. There were no, certainly no big words. And we all are more vulnerable. And uh, in a way, probably more sensitive than, than we would be if, if we hadn't had the difficulties or the differences. I never went to anyone and said, I can't read. Like spelling and reading were like, like a spider that like crawled up my back and just sat there. You know, when it got to my turn to read, I started reading. And I think I made it past the sixth or seventh word. And then the teacher said, next. Boy, I never, ever, ever will forget that. That was, I wish he would have just come over and just slapped me. I could have took that much better. Gentlemen, y'all doing all right? I was told that I'm, I am the youngest dean in the state of Mississippi. My experience in school, I was a special ed student. And to have that kind of label, you know, from grade school all the way up through high school, it's not something, it's not fun. Oh, yeah. That, uh... And then, you know, it doesn't help to have Troy Brown because Troy Brown can rhyme with a lot of things. You know, Brown, coolest guy in town, whatever, you know. Town always seems to wind up in it somehow or another. But, uh, you know, it was Troy Brown, the dumbest kid in town. The special ed class was downstairs in the basement, so I would wait for the bell to ring. And then when everybody had gone to class, I would kind of like run down the, the stairs. People knew that I was in the class, but they never were going to see me going to the class. You never left the special ed class thinking that you were a scholar. <laughs> there were people in that class that had profound problems. I can remember there was a gentleman in a wheelchair, and he couldn't really communicate, but we communicated. We had a dialogue with one another, because I think we both felt that this class wasn't something that was helping us. That experience has helped me to be a, a little bit more sensitive. When I see kids here on campus, I can pick it up just like that. It's easy to pick it up. And a lot of times, you have to be the courage for that individual. Hi. Hi, sir. Is something wrong? Me. I'm wrong. That's what's wrong. We got our mythology exam back today. Guess what I got? A C. You know, you have these key people at certain points in your life, and they do little bitty things that have such a large impact. As, as we told you before, as long as you work hard and study. Dr. Bill Cosby was asked to be the commencement speaker at Russ College, and I wound up driving Dr. Cosby. You know why? And so we were on our way back to Holly Springs, and I just commended him on a show that he had done with Theo. And, it, and he was highlighting 
Theo uh, and his struggle to learn because Theo was, was playing a character that had dyslexia. All I want to know is why. When I think I know everything, I can't even answer anything right. Now maybe this and come to find out, it was a story about his son, Ennis. And so at that point, I kind of felt comfortable in opening up to him, and I told him the problems that I was having. And it, it kind of really, the magic kind of took off then. He goes into the gymnasium, and he goes up to the podium, and I'm standing off to the side. What's the young man's name who drove us here? Troy Brown. Troy Brown? Well, is Troy here? Right Troy, will you come up here, please? I had no idea why he was calling me up to the stage because, see, that wasn't in the script. So I was just trying to figure out why is he calling me up to the podium. So he called me up there, and I stood beside him. He said, Troy is dyslexic. And that just knocked the breath out of me because at that point, I hadn't shared that with anybody. Troy is dyslexic. Came here with an awful lot of differences about himself, about his family. Uh, I said, my goodness, this man has blown my cover. And I really didn't know how to accept it at first. You know, I really didn't know how to accept that. I didn't know how my friends were going to accept it. But it gave me an opportunity to accept it. I want you to take this off of me. This is mine. But I want to present it to Troy. And I want Troy to wear mine along with his at his graduation from the University of Mississippi. I think from that point, the healing started to take place. It was the rite of passage into the reconciliation, uh, into the, you're gonna start feeling good about Troy Brown, you know, uh, and, and that's it, Troy Brown. Not Troy Brown, the dumbest kid in town, but you're gonna start feeling good about Troy Brown. I work between 12 to 16 hours a day, and depending on the crisis, I guess you could say, uh, it may be longer than that. Well, I walk the campus so often, they just recognize my silhouette. I'm here as dean of a university, and one of the youngest deans ever. And I came from a background where I could hardly read or write, stepping onto a college campus. And I still have problems with my reading and writing today. You know, dyslexia is not something that goes away. It's something that you learn to cope with. There are many people out there that wish that they were sitting here, but they're not. They're in prison. And I have friends that are in prison or that are dead or walk in the street. So um, I could have been there also. So who am I to be boastful or brag? You know, no, I have uh, a debt to repay. I have a responsibility, and I'm going to carry that out. My son, Troy D. Brown, Jr., is eight years old. He knows that I'm proud of him, but he also knows that my level of expectation you know, it's the pull of expectation, I think, that helps a person to do their best. He knows I expect a lot from him. All right. uh, good night. Good night. It's not a happenstance situation. It's my responsibility to prepare him for what lies beyond that door, that threshold at my house. I'm the person responsible for making sure that he's prepared to deal with it. 
And you better believe I'm going to follow through. He's Troy Brown Jr., and no one has ever called him the dumbest kid in town. My parents really helped me a lot during school, and uh, I don't think I gave them enough credit for it. But they were basically the driving force behind me. They're the ones telling me, don't give up, don't give up. My parents always believed in me because they, um, they would do anything just to let me have a good education. If you have a child that has this issue, you have to become the advocate for that child. Nobody else is going to do that. Acknowledging. Acknowledging without uh, being embarrassed is the first, largest, most important step on the face of the earth. I, like, I owe all this to my mom. I mean, I want to dedicate this to my mom because she's like, she just turned like my, my bad life into a great life now. Yeah, my parents have been incredibly supportive uh, my entire life to all my endeavors. <laughs> It was second grade that I really remember struggling concretely, where uh, sort of the painful experiences started happening, where, you know, I, I was getting the message that I wasn't staying with the rest of the pack. In the outdoor community, I'm known as um, the first and only woman to go across the ice to both poles. Um, no other woman has done this yet, so it's a, it's a very small club. This is exactly what I do best. I feel really good doing it. Um, I feel, you know, scared to death in a classroom. I always say that my mother was my best advocate in those early years because she seemed to know that there were other things going on and I was extremely expressive physically. Because reading was so difficult, I would gravitate to, to anything that had a lot of pictures in it. And obviously, National Geographic was a, a place for me to find out information. Um, because there was a short blurb of, of r the written text right under the photograph, and I could deal with that. I never believed, you know, that I could be in that magazine. I so much wanted to be in that magazine, but I don't think I believed that could happen. Seventh grade, two teachers volunteered to tutor us. Um, one was a very good athlete, and um, she got this idea that we would, the four of us would go skiing. And uh, the science teacher, she would go skiing with us. She had never been on skis before, and that I would be the teacher. And um, she was a terrible skier, and it was hard work. It was just sort of, it was an eye-opening experience, and I think it really fed me. To think that I had some self-worth, you know, that I, I did have something to offer. Didn't know exactly what that was, but I, you know, I liked the feeling. <laughs> I wanted more of it. I think it was ninth grade when the teachers started this uh, journaling exercise, and I was so resentful of this. I thought it was just hogwash to write every day in this book. And so I was very resistant to starting this whole thing, and, and by the end of the term, I was, I was hooked. And I've been journaling ever since. <laughs> I wrote in my journal on the North Pole that I would hide my tears behind a face mask in a cold day, and, it's astoundingly perfect for my experience for school. I mean, it totally resonates for that experience all those years. 
Absolutely. I think it took me six years to get through college. It was a big accomplishment. Where the realization happened is on the Arctic Ocean, um, working a dog team all by myself. We're all struggling. And as I pull the line back, my feet come right out from under me, I fall right on my tush, really hard on the ice. And, I, and I'm so tired, all I want to do is just cry. And I'm so tired, I can't even cry. And I say, you know, if I can get through college, I can get through to this trip and get to the North Pole. And I'm kind of, you know, in the pity bag. And, <laughs> and it is the realization that sort of ends up to be, in some ways, my mantra to this day. It's college was much more difficult. These polar trips and the things that I'm doing now are, are a direct result of my struggle in school. It was putting one foot in front of the other. That's all I'm doing on the ice. Um, it gave me that, that struggle in school gave me that, that, that single line of purpose. Um, it gave me that, that ability, I think. It helped define that ability to push out the extraneous noise and focus in on what needs to get done. I have learned as a result, I think, of my struggles in schools to take my weaknesses and acknowledge them. <laughs> and that's been a hard lesson. Um, and utilize them so that in actuality, they're really a strength. As six adventurers from different parts of the world stand where the lines of longitude of all countries meet, we believe this journey stands for hope. Hope that our seemingly impossible goals can be met by people everywhere. I don't mind being alone, but I hate being lonely. And the learning difference sometimes separated me so much that I, I also felt lonely. And I finally realized I never was doing this alone. I thought I was. I was hell-bent to do it alone. But I, I wasn't alone. And I didn't do it alone. I didn't get through school by myself. I, I do feel that having a learning difference has been a blessing, not a curse. It's, it's been, it, it has been the gift. Um, I think it has gotten me to the North Pole and the South Pole. I really do believe that. Um, because it has given me those things that you need to get to those places. back on my younger years and my development, me as a human being as Bruce Jenner. My greatest gift in life was being dyslexic. You know, and the reason I say that, now I wouldn't have said that when I was in fourth grade sitting there in class, but today I can say that. It's because it made me different than anybody else. It made me special. I think it served me because it kept me more of an open thinker. It, it, it forced me to go into the, uh, the other realms of understanding my, the other aspects of our, our intelligence. I didn't have to be, in my artwork, I didn't have to be liberated because I was always free, because nobody thought like I did. I began to write poetry uh, sometime before high school, and uh, that's how I, I was expressing myself, but I showed it to no one. I was, I was, I was a closet poet. Even though I wasn't very good at sports or I wasn't very good in, in school itself, there were a lot of things that I knew more than, than, than a lot of other students. And, and 
and I could actually prove that to them every time every every time the science fair rolled around I'd make a science project and I would win a lot of times I couldn't do the school plays because I uh, that was extracurricular and I wasn't I didn't have a, a C average do you know so I couldn't participate in what I wanted to do it was hard because every the teacher used to correct papers and they were all like check check and then the teacher would bust out the red pen for my work and for a spelling and things it was just red everywhere I just I didn't care really anymore that because so much red was on my paper that I just didn't care anymore. Maybe you have a gift that's going to get squelched because you don't feel good about yourself and you're not going to be able to give your gift, your individual gift, to the world in any way, shape, or form because you're walking around trying to hide yourself. In high school, we would read these novels, you know, like uh, The Octopus by Frank Norris about the Grange Wars. Uh, and uh, all these guys, you know, they. They were all writing in the margins. Uh, they were writing similes and metaphors, and but they were between the reading between the lines. I couldn't read the line, let alone between them. I wanted to write what they were writing. I mean, I wanted to have something, you know, that oh, it looks so important, you know. So what I did was I took drops of water and I dropped them over the pages, and the pages crinkled up. And when I carried the book, it really looked like I was using it. You know, like I was just really just going back and forth, you know. I didn't have the slightest idea what the book was about. If I had a classroom like this when I was back in school, maybe I would have felt the freedom to be able to express myself. At about third grade, it became apparent to me that Everybody else was in a better group than I was, and I just kind of thought, well, they're smarter than I am, and that truly affected my self-esteem somewhere along the line. I don't think that the counselors had a lot of confidence in my ability, and as a result, uh, they sort of wrote me off to go to a junior college and to get married. I later decided to get my master's degree almost solely on the basis of the fact that how dare anybody make a presumption that I can't do whatever it is that I want to do. I'd probably have turned around that feeling of anger and used it in a positive way because I'm a very stubborn person who doesn't like people to tell me what I can and can't do. If you walked in the door to my classroom, you would see a full working space station model. We have full hydroponic labs, which feed lettuce to the school cafeteria. I teach at a public school that has the same type of funding as all public schools. Private funding is not that difficult to find if you have a vision of what it is that you want to do. I've been making unusual classroom environments my entire teaching career. I've never worked within the realms of the four walls. I've always worked within the realms of the ceiling as part of the environment. Godzilla hangs over my desk to uh, subtly remind them who's in charge. <laughs> I probably gear my program mostly to that person who is having difficulty understanding why they're in school. They've already tuned it out by the time they get to me. By the time I get done with them, they will look at school in another way. One of the strong points that I have developed over time uh, to compensate for some of the things that are more difficult for me is that uh, ability to visualize what something might look like finished. Uh, I can visualize what my yard would look like if I had it all finished, and I have every phase of it in my head.
My little village that I have in my house, I put up uh, right after Thanksgiving, and I leave up through the winter. And it's kind of like my little escape thing. I create worlds. Can you see this bridge up here? Which one of my previous students designed? The span of You'd be building and engineering and making bridges that span across your entire table using simple materials. It'd be awesome. Your supervisor is the number one person at your table, raise your hand. Your number two person is the person who's going to take care of equipment, raise your hand. Your number three person is going to tell everybody whether they're doing a good job. Remember, no put down, never. And the number four person is going to take care of timing. Everybody know what they're doing? Ready? Begin. The first thing that we learned to say in uh, science is, I was wrong, <laughs> or I failed, it didn't work. And I tell them that 85% of what we do in science doesn't work, but it's the documentation of what we're doing along the way that's important. We don't have a car. It's going to be okay because when you do get it, and you will, it'll be worth more than any therapy I can send you to because you will have done something beyond your wildest expectations, something you never thought you were capable of doing. And as a result, you've built self-esteem. I didn't have to tell you how good you were. You knew it. I don't know what planet you're from. You certainly do look strange to me. But Earthlings do things in a particular way when I was a, a child in the classroom, I kind of felt like an alien. I don't know, maybe that's why this theme came up. Traveling Earth time. Are you ready for the adventure? Yes. All right, let's go. Raise your right hand. As a new resident. As a new resident. Of Peterson Middle School. The idea of the alien theme kind of allowed us to account for the fact that our kids are all coming in with different levels of expertise. We make absolutely no assumptions when they walk in the door. We tell them that we will treat them as though they know nothing. And you can sort of see the relief flush over their faces. They go, thank God, I don't have to know anything. I do so freely. And will. And will. Work hard. You're going to start off and we will teach everything that we have to, sh to tell you in such a way that you will get it. Self-esteem is built on achievement, not through my perception of how they're doing. They have to feel it down to their toes that this is the very best thing they've ever done in their whole life. And every day that they walk into my classroom, I expect what they do to be better than it was the day before. Welcome to the world. Watch those feet. Science, we had to take notes and things. I was awful at that. And school now is doing two column notes. And you would like have to fold a piece of paper in two columns, and you write it and write the main ideas and then details. Details are probably what, what you were writing about, kind of definitions. Use um, highlighter yellow for the details and the main idea. We would have a pink highlighter. I feel special because I've learned all these things and I know that that's going to help me in life. I, I amaze myself because like, I, I do stuff that I don't even know. I thought it wasn't even possible. If you can teach them how to learn their way and they know how to learn, they will be able to go do anything they want to do. It's. It's just knowing how to do it, how to work with me and how to work with teachers. It's just knowing like what my how my brain thinks. Learning now um, is like a dream come true. It's like woohoo, you know. I mean, it's just awesome. I just it's like eating ice cream, like. When, and on a hot day, you just need something to cool off, so you eat ice cream. 
and that's like, oh, yes, you know? And it's just like that. It's like eating ice cream. It's like, ooh. I remember times when I used to lay in bed and uh, just wonder, why can't I read? When you have a learning difference and you're young, you have to build a, a wall within yourself to hide what you don't know. I never forget this student in the reading class. Uh, he decided to come up with a spelling bee. Uh, I wanted to get out of the crowd and just escape, but I was the first person he asked to spell the word, which was sky. He said, how do you spell sky? And I said, S, and I couldn't think. So he said, well, you dumb. When I retired, uh, my original plan was, I like bowling, was to go back, was to get a 300 perfect game and get my ring and my jacket. Uh, but my wonderful nephew had other plans. He said, oh, why don't you go back to school? And I said, go back to school? And I said, if I couldn't get it when I was young, I definitely can't get it now. So he said, oh, look, uh, yes, you can. He said, I know a place where you can go, be diagnosed. He said, maybe you have a learning difference. So I said, OK, nephew, I'll do it for you. And when I went to find out what the damage was, well, what the diagnosis was, uh, all these papers was on the desk. And I said, boy, this has to be awful, whatever's wrong with me. And they said, <clears throat> you're dyslexic, and you can be taught. And that was the best news that I ever heard in my life. started going to school. I'm, I'm like a 56-year-old kid. I'm enjoying it. I'm having fun. The reason why I'm having fun now is because it's coming to be easier. And see, I used to look down the tunnel, I couldn't see nothing. Uh, I could see some light now, so. Because when you have a learning difference, your confidence level is is like a scale is up and down. And now mine is just up. That's all that's on my mind, as far as my academics and the wonderful uh, family support I have. I, I can't lose. I can't lose. I might put in maybe about 12 hours a day right from school to study. And then I call my baby. <laughs> Going back to school was, um, it was painful. Leaving home, it, it puts a little hurt there in the heart. To uh, remember uh, all of that, I remember all my family and my friends who always said I would, I would be some. They were right. Once I received the proper help that I needed, it's, it's no stopping. I'm still receiving a, a good education. And it takes a lot. I put a lot of time in. 
but I don't regret it because it's due to me. And this was a fisherman. He always liked to fish. That was his favorite hobby. And this enlightened me, and I really appreciate what he brought forth for me. Probably if it weren't for any time, well, I would have went to uh, my grave not ever knowing that I could learn. And this cross between me for around four summers. I don't know, I don't know how to explain this. And it's just love teaching kids in general. And it's just had fun teaching. And Annis was here right now, he'll probably be a teacher. He'll be tutoring me in the summer or something. So it'll be pretty fun. I mean, here's a, here's a special mind that might not be gotten to by anybody else. And you have a chance to, to help, help this mind find its own enlightenment. Like what, greater, what greater purpose can there be in teaching? I know that, that uh, the teachers who cared about me created this supreme place for me where I felt most confidence in the most confidence I'd ever felt. And finally, I heard in the world of, of education, the term come up, uh, learning differences. And I said, OK, now that one I'll buy. That is, that is true, and it is so important that we see ourselves that way. And that's what I want for the child to do, is to visualize where he is now and to be able to see beyond that. It's like the clouds are gone. And it's easier for, it's easier for me to see. I found out that the maze was just open. It was just like a straight line right through. And there might be a little wall, but I could still jump it. And to stand there in front of millions of people and read a teleprompter, to me, was a greater success than winning the games, you know? Because I had to overcome up so much to get there. Every book is, I've crossed the finish line, you know? I've won the gold. Uh, and they, uh, when I look at them, I have a great sense of pride, a great sense of accomplishment, you know? that I don't have in a lot of other things. I don't look at my career and go, wow, I've accomplished so much. But when I look at my books, I think, wow, this is great. This is terrific. Like, if you keep running, you'll finally finish the end, the end line, and you finally reach the end line. And maybe you'll get a, you'll get a trophy for you know, being in first place, and maybe you won't. but. Still, it's just a great feeling that you actually finished the race. How do I learn? Please teach me so I can turn time from a rock into a free-flowing mountain river on a hot day. That's how I learn. Like honey, may the sweet flow of the river last so I can get past this rock of a class. Ennis Cosby wanted all children to feel that learning could be like the sweet flow of the river that he writes about in his poem, Patience. Unfortunately, many children with learning differences still don't receive the understanding or teaching that they need, and this affects all of us. It no longer has to be this way. There is a growing body of research and knowledge about effective teaching to reach children with learning differences, and it can be applied in our classrooms now. The people in this film all found ways to share their gifts in spite of their difficulties in school, but many more have never had the chance. It is for them that Ennis Cosby's words resonate the most. How do I learn? Please teach me.